What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is August 3rd of 2018. Well folks, it's time for a daily update here on the Datadash channel and today we've got a wide range of topics to discuss here on the update. First and foremost as always though, we're going to be spending a good amount of time taking a look at market valuations as well as doing some technical analysis on the market leaders. But outside of this as well, we've got a lot of interesting topics to discuss in regards to the headlines. We're going to be talking about a recent Forbes article that came out discussing about the craziness and the potential corruption in the crypto ICO space. We're also going to be talking about how Hedera Hashgraph, one of the big ICOs coming up soon has come out with an initial valuation of six billion dollars before it's even hit exchanges and along with that as well we're going to be talking about the re-emergence of a past crypto figure and last but not least as always we're going to be taking a little bit of a look at traditional markets as well as specifically on some signs of an early turning point in housing markets so that being realized let's go ahead and dive into the update guys for the most part bitcoin is down around three percent over the past 24 hours and with this as always alts are coming in even harder to the downside so you can look across the board here these aren't really you know crappy projects these are some well-known ones for example like waves and walton chain pivx and icon and even some of the new emerging protocols like one chain and v chain so because of this uh, i, I want to spend a decent amount of time here uh, before we continue moving forward again to let you guys know about the current state of altcoins uh, I've already made additions. I'm not going really shopping today or anytime this week, I think, on altcoins. I'm remaining patient until we see a trend reversal. I've already added to some plays that I like, and again, it's just playing for the longer term swing here. The next addition that I'm going to be making to altcoins is going to be when I see that trend reversal. So again, I've talked to you guys. I think we're in the seventh or eighth inning at the moment. Uh, we've got probably a good few more days to a week uh, or maybe two to three weeks at max. Uh, continuation uh, of a bear market for altcoins. It doesn't mean that we have a long drastic amount of ways to go down, but again, we still have a little ways to go before I think we're going to get the turn up, and that's going to be probably at the end of August from what data points show us uh, historically with cryptocurrencies. We tend to find that August is, is the month that things turn. Going forward here, let's go ahead and take a look here at market capitalization, still holding around $261 billion. So at the moment, we're holding well above our $250 billion metric here on market cap. Again, we want to hold that. Uh, again, we might dip slightly below it. Again, if altcoins continue to get crushed and if Bitcoin uh, breaks through the line of uh, support or previous line of resistance, hoping that it would be line of support. But we'll have to see that later on when we do our TA. And Bitcoin dominance is starting to get close to plateauing. Again, the big thing I always tell people to uh, do when you're, you're taking a look at these charts, now there can always be a change. You can always, for example, maybe have uh, Bitcoin start to uh, plateau in dominance and then it could spike up randomly. You know, there's always a potential for black swan events. There's always a potential for changes in patterns that come out of nowhere. But for the most part, Bitcoin dominance, as we can see here over the past, you know, few weeks here from early to mid-July has started to flatten out a little bit and altcoins or other coins in this case have started to come down towards their previous levels that we saw back in March. So that's the range where I'm starting to get eager on altcoins again, getting towards the seventh, eighth inning and hopefully towards that ninth inning where we can start to go shopping in that sense and pick up some of our favorite projects. Going on here to take a look at Bitcoin, I really want to focus in on Bitcoin here for the TA side of things. Volume uh, in the market right now has still remained relatively low. Again, higher than what we were seeing back a few weeks ago, but nonetheless, still relatively low. If we take it here to the hourly, um, hourly though, we have had a slight breach down past the line of uh, previous resistance in Bitcoin that was holding since all the way back in January. Now, this isn't something that I'm panicking about. Again, I, I told you all that I'm going to give this some room. I, I'm definitely not going to, uh, in any sense, allow whales to just get everyone to panic in that sense, or at least make me panic. Um, so what I, I would recommend, you know, in, in my personal opinion, what I'm currently watching is for Bitcoin to hold along this level. I'll go ahead and take it to the daily so it's a little more clear. Again, I said that 7,200, breaking severely below 7,200 would be my genuine concern. That's when I would be a little bit fearful. At the moment, though, we're still riding generally along this line, and I want to see it hold on this key level of support around 7,200, which we can see held 
two times in the past year, relatively over the past few months. So let's give it some room, give it a little bit of room to breathe. Price can fluctuate in these low volume markets. And again, don't let a slight $100 move make you panic sell or get fearful. Um, now my strategy, if we do a break below 7200, because I want to keep open to both ideas, if it does happen, uh, I'm probably going to wait uh, to towards making any addition to Bitcoin uh, or any additions to altcoins until we get down to 6800. But I got to tell you all, the more plausible case I think I, I, that I see happening is a ride down amongst this line until we get down towards this base level here where we can see that Bitcoin was resisted two times at 6,800. That would be the more bearish case. Uh, if not that, we're going to get a bounce up here and ride off and test the highs up here. And maybe even get a cup and handle. That would be really, really nice here if we could get the price action cupping off of it, testing the highs, breaking down a little bit, and then continuing higher, hopefully maybe into some large catalyst announcement like uh, an ETF or Ethereum futures contracts, whatever it may be. Going on here, though, let's go ahead and take a look at a few of the other players here. Ethereum getting a little bit of a bounce here with some of the alts the other day, testing to see if it can hold on the support level. Again, as you all know, uh, I haven't changed my viewpoint. I still think we're going to see this test towards the lower level, test towards the lower line here, the line of support that we've seen on Ethereum. Ripple, again, like most players, I'm going to run through some of these and talk about a few more interesting ones. Ripple has had a little bit of resilience here over the past few uh, past few days, but nothing serious in regards to uh, volume or trend reversal. As we take a look here, I'll pull it up here on uh, Binance. Oh, I've got the index label on. Um, here on Binance again, nothing serious on the side of volume here. I think the bigger, the bigger buyers are going to wait toward, uh, towards the lower end of things. Bitcoin Cash, again, continuing slowly downwards towards the 9 million Satoshi mark, still my target at the moment. EOS, uh, comparative to Bitcoin, EOS remains flat over the past week, no serious price action comparative to Bitcoin, but Again, I don't see this as a key level of support in this case. Uh, if it were, it would have been held up here. As we can see, it tried to hold it, but we had a breakdown below it. So I think this has got a little bit more ways to go. All right, so let's talk about a few other protocols and cryptocurrencies that I tend not to talk about too much. One that I've been generally watching is Dash. So as we take a look at Dash here, some of these larger cap currencies, what I've noticed with a lot of them is that a lot of them are coming back to previous highs way back in 2016 and looking to see if they can maintain a support. So Dash has closed down the majority of its Bitcoin comparative gains that we've seen throughout 2017. And I'm noticing that we're getting close to testing a lot of these key levels. So I'll go ahead, draw the line here, and we can see that obviously every time prices had a you know dramatic drops on some of these exchanges this is poloniex maybe we should get a better exchange like binance but we can see that price is coming down to this range that looks relatively favorable and volume has remained quite steady here looks like trading is still relatively active on dash so because of this i'm definitely going to keep an eye on volume see if we get any big buyers see if we get any big swings in price action but this goes with a lot of the large caps at the moment in the market. It's the same with Litecoin. It's the same with a lot of players that are coming down and closing a lot of those gains that they'd seen over 2017 comparative to Bitcoin. doesn't mean that they're not still way up comparative to where they were, but comparative to Bitcoin in this case. I want to talk about Monero as well. I've been keeping an eye on Monero. Monero, uh, Monero is now finally going down lower. It's gotten rejected at the lowest Fibonacci level and looks like it's steadfast towards 1,300,000 Satoshis. This has been my target for a while. Again, we see every single time that Monero makes new comparative Bitcoin highs in the longer term cycles and still holds a relatively higher level on the line of support here. We can see over here, over here, over here, over here, etc. So I don't think history is going to be any different here. Uh, now, I would definitely, if I were to consider a trade on Monero in this case, I definitely wouldn't be waiting exactly until it gets down there because I think people on the TA side of things are going to pick up trend. You know, they're going to want to start buying a little bit ahead of time in anticipation for it. But again, we'll have to see if volume can hold up, if Monero can hold that line of uh, support as it has in the past. So we'll have to see. Going on here, I want to talk about Icon. Icon, I've noticed, much like a lot of these protocols that had a great initial run up from their exchange launch, much like Amise Go and all these things, are coming down towards their initial uh, open price. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on Icon at 1,000 sats. We're very close to it, and with altcoins continuing to flush, another 20% decline could very well happen here. Either way, it's getting into an area that feels much more comfortable for me personally, but I have not initiated any additional trades on Icon at the moment. ADA BTC, Cardano. If you know crypto is continuing on the path that they are right now, guys, it, Cardano could easily come down to 1500 sats, this previous level of resistance. And again, we're starting to see protocols get in a very, very cheap range. Uh, but 
you know, again, we have to we have to be cautious here still. Again, I, I've, I've stated it in a visual manner in the seventh or eighth inning. I think we have one last flush to come through, and that's going to come sometime over the next week or so. So going on here, we'll talk about two more protocols. I haven't talked about this one in a while. Nulls, many people have been asking me about. Nulls testing towards a key support level around 25,000 Satoshis. I think that it's probably going to hold here. Um, and I think worst case scenario, you test down towards this previous range of resistance before we had the breakout. Could happen, but I don't think you're going to see, and especially in some of these small caps that are already relatively cheap um, compared to other players, I think that Nulls is going to probably hold around this range. So I'm going to keep an eye on that uh, for a potential rebound. Okay, so we've dimmed through uh, a few of the other players. Uh, I know probably I didn't mention some of the other ones like Neo and everything, but those are, again, still on the, the trend that I, I've stated in previous videos. I think most of them are still set for a decline. Again, most altcoins stick together, guys. That's what you have to remember here. So I recommend playing the bigger cycles. This is what I do personally, and we have to just remain patient and vigilant. And for those of you who are exposed to alts, I feel you guys, I'm a little bit exposed in alts as well. Uh, you know, that's just the pain of the market at the moment, you know. So we have to see uh, a higher risk tolerance environment come up uh, into fruition compared to what we have right now, which is just not the case. You know, we have to see Bitcoin momentum first as it's tended historically uh, for altcoins to move with it as well. So remaining patient, remaining vigilant and looking for some nice discounts. So I want to spend some time to talk about this article about FBG, Financial Blockchain Group, one of the largest hedge or, um, crypto hedge funds in the space and i've been talking a lot about you know the corruption in the ico space and the craziness of the ico space as well as so we'll talk about hedera hashgraph and other players uh not only today but later down the road so i want to spend some time to dive into this article this is an article by jeff coughlin who was posted in forbes and he was describing his visit uh into uh what i remember is hong kong and actually going to visit fbg one of the largest hedge funds in the crypto space learning about what it's like uh, you know, to run the, the fund and everything, how their business operates, and to really kind of dive into the amount of money that they have made. Uh, FBG has been a very successful fund, one of the most successful ones out there in the crypto space, because as we'll learn throughout the article, uh, it talks about not only their successes, but the ways that they achieved it. And I, I'm not here to personally attack FBG. I just think that this is a great on-ramp into understanding kind of the craziness of the ICO space. So it talks a little bit about the founder and the team personally and how they basically had humble beginnings where he had started with you know, 10,000 in savings and bought Bitcoin in the uh, early $100 range uh, compared to where most people have probably bought it in the thousands. But Going on here, uh, they talked about how they were able to amass an initial amount of capital and have been able to practically 10x their return, starting off with around, if I remember here, amassed around $20 million from Chinese investors. So with FBG being this really successful fund, uh, not only investing in early stage product um, projects, but also um, trading them as well. You know, you usually don't see this with funds. Most funds and venture capital, uh, you know, organizations, what they usually do is they invest heavily in a project and they hope to exit it in the long term. They want, for example, to catch a unicorn. This is the traditional way that investing happens. So you want to invest in an early stage startup, get early stage investment, uh, get a good amount of equity or holdings in it, and then sell it off to a larger client later down the road or let it go public on the stock exchange like Facebook or Twitter, or, you know, you name it, Google, all these companies. But in the crypto space, uh, you know, FBG is a little bit different because unlike those traditional funds that operate that way, FBG actively trades. Uh, they are active participants in writing hype cycles and writing off news and writing off projects that bring excitement, but not so much on fundamentals. And FBG is not the only one. Uh, this is what a lot of funds tend to do. So it's really interesting to see Forbes actually talking about this here on the left-hand side and talking about legit and dubious crypto strategies because whether it's legit or dubious, a lot of this is going on. Uh, so let's go down here. I really wanted to talk about um, down here. I think this is probably the best um, method as to how these funds have been able to build up stories and sell them to people. So first off, building relationships with exchanges and recommended coins to list. This is something that I talked about. Again, th if there is any doubt in people's minds that the funds in this space don't have good connections to exchanges, 
oh, I, I, I'm not going to name names again. There's, there's, there's no need to really name names in that sense to point at specific names. Uh, they're generally along the lines of all playing by the same rules. They have connections to these funds. You can see their holdings instantly get listings on a variety of major uh, exchanges that process tens, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of daily volume. And I love that as well. They really base around investing in projects that have good marketers. And I, I like how they don't market this as, as slightly dubious in a sense, because these projects should be based off their fundamentals. It shouldn't be marketing a good project. Now, you are building an ecosystem. I highly agree with that. Marketing is a factor, and it's not so much seen as a negative thing in crypto, and it shouldn't because this is a new space. We need to market it. But again, most, you know, going off of projects on their CEOs, and they talked about, for example, in FPG's case, they were highly, um, highly confident in uh, Tron on its way of marketing. You know, for example, they pointed out in the article how Justin would write off tons of hype waves. Obviously, we've talked about how he sold, they were generally selling the idea that they'd have a big partnership coming up, and everyone thought that it was Alibaba due to the school that he went through under uh, Jack Ma's school, the founder of Alibaba. And along with that as well, they talked about how he had gotten a branding on the, the NASDAQ uh, the NASDAQ screening in uh, New York City, where you have this massive screen that had the Tron logo, the future of blockchain. You know, Again, this is how they do it. And along with that as well, we're going to talk about the middle part here, which is absolutely true. I know this as a content creator. They've massive, they spent massive amounts of marketing money on paying bloggers or vloggers, people who are creating video content in the crypto space, to promote these ICOs. And there are some people out there who still do this. Um, to be fair, so long as they're stating it, that's fine. I've had my mistakes in the past, but at the same time, I mean, this is this is a, a core factor. And the reason why they need to do this, they need to do this factor as well as building the relationship with the exchanges and finding people who can market and sell their story is because they need to eventually sell their position. And who do you think is going to buy it? Ah, the people who are buying on exchanges. So they need to get on exchanges. And then who are they trying to reach? Retail investors. I mean, again, I hope that I'm coming across as at least slightly honest, guys. And it's uh, the reason I haven't covered ICOs for months on this channel, outside the one that I'm advising for personally. There is no genuine nature in this space when it comes to the ICO space. It's a dirty world. They're flipping these projects. They don't care about fundamentals. They care about selling a story, selling the next big project, and then eventually exiting their position and moving on to the next. They have no obligations for the long term, so long as their lockup period has expired. And boy, uh, the lockup periods are not what they are in the traditional VC world for a lot of these companies. So that's the uh, that's the major point I just want to draw in, guys. Again, this is a great article. I recommend you read through it. Um, it's right here. It's generally just titled Tricks of a Crypto Trader, Meet Asia's Hottest Crypto Hedge Fund. I rambled on about it enough. Let's move on to the next topic. Going on here, Hedera Hashgraph has raised another hundred million doing another seed round, claiming that it has a six billion dollar valuation. It's funny, I had a lot of people in the space, uh, or I had a lot of people asking me about this, but I had a particular person talking about how he had read the uh, recent announcement that Hedera had raised this money and the signed agreement. He said, Oh my god, they must have missed a zero or something on the uh, <laughs> the, the amount of uh, tokens or percentage of tokens they were expecting. And they said, Oh no, we're, this is actually what we, we mean to invest in the project. So, um, anyways, yes, you read that right. Basically, before Hedera Hashcraft has even hit an exchange, it is already sitting at a six billion dollar valuation due to the amount that people have invested early on, the amount that they've raised, and the token allocation that they've given. So, I mean, there's already uh, already a lot of important things to note. The lockup on Hedera Hashgraph's tokens is ridiculous. It's very long term, and the reason for this is because there's so much weighted capital invested in this. Okay, it's again a very very important thing to take away when we're talking about the kind of fraudulent nature of the ICO space. I love Hedera Hashgraph. I'm not saying that this is completely justifiable capitalism. People are investing in projects. They have a right to speculate, but the issue with this is that you're putting all the tokens in the hands of a select few and you're raising all these ridiculous valuations throughout the process. I'm going to just say that I think that a lot of these early stage investors are going to get burnt. I've had people asking me about Hedera Hashgraph and I love the project, but nothing, nothing in this space right now is worth a $6 billion valuation off the bat. 
period. There's no unique selling point that can grant that kind of valuation. As much as I love go the gossip protocols and I love Hedera, um, I, I was talking about Hashgraph when it was still uh, ran under swirls and separate from being a, the public ledger Hedera. But yeah, I just genuinely don't think this is good. So again, they ran through another target. They're still sticking with accredited investors. I recommend you guys look through it if you want a little bit more details, but they publicly announced this uh, I think yesterday, early on on their Twitter account. All right, so going on to the third factor of craziness, it seems like everything today has been relatively negative. I apologize about that. A good sense of laughs. Looks like Reddit has found our loving, our, our beloved crypto YouTuber, who happens to share the same name as I, Crypto Nick, who has gone missing ever since the BitConnect craze, but he hasn't gone missing at the auto dealership. So if we take a look at this photo, there was a recent Snapchat from a supposedly Brooklyn auto sales reading sold and showing our beloved crypto YouTuber here with his new GTR. Yummy. Great car. Congrats to 70 year old self made Nick Travato for Long Island, New York. One of our favorite GTRs found a great home. Well, this is just fantastic, guys. You know, I like seeing people become successes in this space. I mean, maybe if you, you did it riding off of, uh, you know, everyone else losing their money. And, you know, along with that as well, uh, not knowing what a private key is, but hey, I don't know. Congrats to you, Crypto Nick. You may have the car of your dreams. You might be living up the life even though you scammed a bunch of people, but hey, you'll never really know what a private key is. Moving on here, going on to the pre-market here. I'll go ahead and refresh the page here. Um, U.S. futures at the moment are looking quite stagnant. Uh, they were up about 0.3% earlier on most indices, but at the moment uh, we're, we're starting to flatten out as we're waiting for the jobs report to come out for the month. So it'll be really interesting to see. Again, as you all know, I, I generally have been holding kind of a, a reversal tone in the market. Uh, but at the same time, jobs reports have been actually quite impressive as a recent. Uh, but as with Pretty much the past few decades, the jobs report can be manipulated to a pretty decent degree. Nonetheless, though, again, the market's going to live off of what this number says. You know, that's that's just how equities ride. And if it's a good set of numbers, market's going to move higher. With Apple reaching a trillion dollars the other day, and some of the other large Fang stocks, um, for example, like Amazon and Google, steadfast towards that as well, sitting around an eight hundred billion dollar valuation. I'm starting to think that we're going to have the trifecta. We're going to have three trillion dollar companies. And that might be where we see the peak mania of equities markets. So again, as much as I'm bearish, I, I still think you could possibly have maybe a little bit of a, a short-term gain in equities markets. But I'm not dabbling in it. I'm waiting patiently. I'd much rather wait for the longer-term cycle. I think crypto and commodities are too interesting at the moment. And speaking of uh, you know reversals in markets, we're starting to see the early signs of it in the housing market. So this was a really nice article put out on Zero Hedge uh, covering the slowdown and not only price but also home sales in the Hamptons, the high-end market. So uh, if, we, if we take a look here, we can see that as we go down the article, there's some really interesting data points. Um, as the bubble has been building up in the housing market, as we all know, prices have been going up, demand has risen up uh, really since the mid-2010s, uh, recovering out of 2008. But we've recently seen in just second quarter sales that 12.8, we, we've seen levels 12.8 uh, uh, percent lower than what we saw back in 2017 for quarter two sales of the year. And this is also seeing a decline of prices about uh, for about 5.3 percent, where buyers are starting to get a little less eager uh, and are actually starting to wait to make sure they get fair prices. I can tell you guys this because um, <clears throat> where I live, I live more on Main Street. I'm no person living in uh, the Hampton, the Hamptons or, you know, in the Hollywood Hills or anything like that. Uh, but I will say that you can see it in the housing market at the moment. If you're if you're kind of visual, if you like to spot trends, I'm, I'm one of those people, I generally like to go around and see, you know, how many for sale signs are up at the moment. And a lot of people are trying to cash in on their housing uh, profits at the moment. People are getting it on the sell side. And buyers pick it up faster than the sellers. The sellers think they can sell it at a certain price and easily do it. You're like, oh, you know, it's the market right now. I'm looking to move to my next home. Either that or they're not focused. The buyers, however, they're the ones spending. They need to make sure that they're spending their money good and they're getting the best bang for their buck. And we can see that in the peak of housing markets that the buyers start to set lower standards for pricing. And when housing prices start to correct to the degree of 5.3%, 
and housing sales plummet 12.8%, whereas they were just strong about a few months ago. You know, this is definitely a cause for concern in some degree. Again, it's just one of many macro signs. Again, you don't want to panic off of something like this, but it's a sign that, especially on the higher end homes and some of the large cities like New York City and Boston and Toronto and London and, you know, Sydney, Australia, you have all these big cities across the world that are now starting to see housing prices finally correct. And they've been in a massive bubble. They've been in a massive bubble due to foreign investment and due to artificially low interest rates. When those start to change, when the foreign investment dries up and interest rates start to rise, quantitative tightening comes into the market. So again, really interesting topic. Again, I've been keeping an eye on the housing market for a while. Uh, you know, I've, I've always kind of had my alternative view on finance, the contrarian viewpoint, but I haven't been bearish on these markets until the factors change, and they are changing. We're seeing higher interest rates. So I'd like to hear what you guys think about this. What do you guys think about the housing market? What's your estimates You know, for current market cycles? Do you think things are going to continue to the upside in equities markets or in the housing market, or do you think it's going to start turning over soon? And what are your estimates for it? What do you guys think about all the craziness we talked about in the crypto space, and where do you think crypto markets are going at the moment? Love to hear what you guys think down in the comments down below. But until the next video, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.